Our Stories Vietnam is a KRWG local production honoring some of our area Vietnam veterans. These stories could not have been told without the cooperation of not only the veterans who offered to participate, but the families and local veteran groups as well. We are grateful for the support of New Mexico State University and other area organizations. KRWG's presentation of Our Stories Vietnam has been made possible in part by the visionary gift from Stan Fulton, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and viewers like you. Thank you. These are the stories of the Vietnam War as told to us by veterans. KRWG has sought to present archival footage and personal photos that approximates the location and time of their stories. However, they are not actual depictions of the situation or personal recollections. The way I got to Vietnam is I worked at White Sands Missile Range and I had been a logistician. I was called from someone, I guess, at the Pentagon who asked me if I would go to Vietnam. And I thought this was a joke. And I said, are you kidding? And he said, no, we're calling you because you have the skills and we're having a terrible supply problem. So I said, of course I won't go. And my husband asked me who called. And I said, oh, it was some guy from, I guess, the Pentagon, and he wanted me to go to Vietnam. And my husband said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Well, that triggered a response in me, and I said, let's see, you've been all over the world and I haven't been anywhere. So I think I'll go to Vietnam, and I did. When I went there, I got there in November of 1967. As I stepped out of my house and the security of my home, I said, oh my God, what have I done? Well, when we landed at Tonsonu Air Base and the door opened and I walked out, and remember, I was the only woman on this flight. And I thought, well, what have I got myself into here? There was a smell, and it's, it smelled more like a, vinegar, a vinegar. It was a vinegar smell to me, especially when you went outside. When I called this colonel at three o'clock in the morning, who wasn't expecting a woman, said, who the hell is this? And I said, this is Francis Williams, and I'm supposed to report for duty here. So he got me a sergeant who picked me up at about 4.30, and we went through Saigon, looking for a hotel room because they had no quarters for me. Finally found one. So I got settled in and then I reported for duty. And my job was to inventory uh, the supplies at the 14th Inventory Control Center, as well as travel around to other uh, depots that we were issuing supplies to and to see if they had what they said they had in inventory and to correct the inventory because some th things were not getting out into the field. But I do know when we were doing inventories, there was a great gap between what should have been there and wasn't there. We had Viet Cong working around us and working for the military, but we didn't know that until something happened. Well, the days prior to the Tet Offensive were relatively calm. I was standing there waiting for the bus, and usually it's dark, but there's a lot of activity going on with the cyclos running around the streets, etc. And, you know, a Saigon is coming to life. And I really didn't see too much activity in the streets. And I thought, well, okay, I don't know what happened. And suddenly, the Tet Offensive broke out. And I was there at the very beginning. I heard ping, 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 ping around me. I had no idea what that was. And one of the officers who was at the Rex Hotel 
came out, grabbed me by the hand, and said, lady, don't you know there's a war on? And I said, no, I don't. Basically, what was happening is there were two snipers, and they were shooting from the Catholic Church. We went up to the top of the Rex Hotel. I actually witnessed the uh, attempt to take the American embassy. And they did breach the, the first perimeter, but they didn't get into the second one. And we were sitting there, and I felt it was kind of lewd, sitting there and watching a war and seeing people getting killed. And so to see that was terrible for me. When things kind of calmed down, I was able to get back to my hotel room uh, during the next six days, I could not get out to Long Bend, and I waited to the, till things calmed down. My husband was here. He was very concerned about me. He enlisted the ham radio operators, and they finally got a line into Long Bend. The first thing he said when he got on the line, he said, I want you to get your ass on home. And I said, I can't do that. First of all, I can't get out of here, and secondly, I was committed to staying here for a certain period of time, and I'm going to stay here until I'm not needed. What I remember most is the hospital, working at the hospital and seeing what I saw and knowing what war was really like up close and personal. That stays with me all the time. I decided to go down to the hospital, and the hospital was the 24th Avac Center there at Long Bed. And this is where they used to pick the bodies up from the field, the wounded and the dead, and bring them to the hospital. And so one day I went there and I asked the lady, what can I do, I'm not a nurse. That was the beginning of something that I think it's the best thing I ever did in my life. So we had this wonderful nurse. And so she said, well, I've got something for you to do. You be the gopher and the letter writer. Going into the ward, I was not prepared for what I was going to see. And so I started working. And the first guy I had had a tracheotomy. And I tried to write a letter for him but I had to hold my finger to his trachea there. And of course it was uh, to his wife. And he said, don't worry about me. I'm fine, uh, I'll be home soon. Well, the next guy I had was a little 18 year old kid. He had red hair, freckles, and a little curl that went down on his forehead. And he had lost, if I could remember his arm, I asked him if I could write a letter, and he said yes to his mom and dad. I sat down, wrote the letter. Again, don't worry about me. And then he said, I want you to sign it with an X and an O. And I said, well, I know what the X is. That's for a kiss. What is the O for? And he said, it's for a hug. And when he did that, I lost it. I ran out. I was crying. I went out in the night. I cursed God. I cursed the United States Army. And when I finally got myself together, I went back. I just could not get over this waste of lives, especially beginning their lives. When I was going to leave Vietnam and I had to have a guy stamped my passport, and he wanted me to give him money, and I refused. So he took my passport, and one of the attendants said, get on the plane. So I got on the plane, and she came after me, and she got my passport. She threw it at me. She said, go. As we were flying to Singapore, the pilot said, we have someone on the board who did not exit properly, and we have to turn around. And basically, I told the flight attendant what had happened, but there were two people waiting for me who wanted my passport. So that was my exit from Vietnam. 
when I was in San Francisco. I didn't see any of that, but in other places that I went to, there was a lot of disrespect. And of course, we know some of them were called baby killers. I didn't hear that, but I did see some people spitting at them. And uh, I just wanted to go up there to say, do you know what you're doing? Those men fought and died, whether you agree with the war or not. They went there, they were asked to do a job, they were tasked to do a job, and how dare you, how dare you? It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, memorial, and it's very well thought out, but I think ours is one of the most beautiful, and it depicts specifically what we put into the war by each of the services and the men who were killed in action, and building that memorial was a labor of love. If I had the opportunity to do what I did in Vietnam, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Because I never felt as useful, like I said. It was the best thing I ever did in my life. My name is uh, Johnny Holguin. I was the United States Marine Corps, first battalion. 4th Marines, 3rd Marine Division, from Barlow, New Mexico. I graduated from Gaston High School, a lot of graduates from there. If they didn't go to college, they joined the military, you know, and that's, that's the way it was in those days. I enlisted into the Marine Corps. Uh, my family, my father served in the Army in World War II, received a Bronze Star. My brother was in the Air Force, uh, 1960, 1964. We like to serve our country, and, uh, and that's why I joined the Marine Corps, to serve my country. And we stepped off the plane and we could, it was a, like a dank, musty smell of Vietnam. And then what, what really felt embarrassed about is we were, our utility uniforms were nice and clean and green and the Marines walking around caked in mud and dirty. So everybody knew we were the newbies in Vietnam the very first day. Uh, we were born in Da Nang, Da Nang. And then from Da Nang we went and we joined the unit at Phu Bai was stationed there. During that Upper Spur Hawk, yeah, we were anxious and tense. We had just been in Vietnam, you know, a matter of a couple of weeks, so it was kind of a new experience for her. the countryside, the jungle, the water, the rivers, you know, coming from New Mexico down here where it's dry and arid, half in the water sometimes and half out of the water. And it's, it was a unique experience that uh, I'll never forget. You're always, I think I was wet from the time first day I was in Vietnam to the day I left, you know. So it seems to me like it was always raining. I had scars on my arm for a long time from cutting through that elephant grass, you know, and it grew pretty high and it was pretty sharp. It was hard to see through it, you know. It, it, was, it was easy to hide if you were trying to hide from somebody, but it was hard to see through if you were trying to find somebody. I thought I was a brave and courageous guy in high school and, you, and, and in the Marine Corps, but when you get over there and, and uh, people start shooting at you or lobbing grenades or, or mortars at you, and they're going off near you. I mean, that's, to me, it was a traumatic experience. Uh, you always feel like you have a rock in your stomach and something's gonna happen, you know? And uh, anybody that says they weren't afraid is lying because you, there's, there's uh, fear involved. June 5th, June 6th, LZ Loon was close to the Laotian border. We had two companies there, Charlie Company and Delta Company. I was attached to Charlie Company with mortars. We got hit the minute we were there. Got hit by rockets, artillery, mortar fire, small as far as snipers, everything you can think of. I got a call to report to the staff sergeant. Uh, I didn't really want to leave my foxhole, but I had to. So I ran to the first sergeant with that. He said, uh, you know what? You have an emergency message back in the rear. In Fubai, you need to leave in the next helicopter. So I waited for the next helicopter, and while I was waiting, uh, I was trying to make my way to the landing pad, and the uh, lieutenant told me there's a guy that's really badly hurt taking with you to the helicopter, but he was, uh, he was hurt really bad. He was, he, his legs were blown off, his genitals were blown off, and he didn't want to be evacuated. He wanted to die there, and I waited a couple of minutes and stuff with him, and uh, I turned around, and he had died, so I carried on my soldier to the helipad and, and put him in the helicopter.
before I got home, I, actually there's another Marine that was with me in my same unit, Martin Martinez. He got home in August and I didn't get home till November. So he said two days after he got home, he went to Valo to visit with my parents and tell them that I was okay. And you know, Martin and I are good friends up to this day. I came back to the States just a couple in November 23rd of 1968. It was okay, we landed in, in California and we were told not to wear our uniforms on our way home and, and I didn't wear mine. My mother and my father were waiting for me at the airport in El Paso. It seems like in the valley, a lot of veterans from the, from the cities didn't receive uh, much support, but in the valleys, like in Vado and La Mesa, these little communities back there, there's a lot of support, there's a lot of admiration for, for Marines and soldiers who are coming back from Vietnam. I think it was different for us. People looked up to us. I went back to Camp Pendleton for another year and a half in California, and I think that there was a lot of difference in California, how they treated uh, Vietnam veterans and what they did in Doniana County, so to speak. After LZ Loon, you know, uh, the second day there was four of our guys that were MIA from that helicopter that was shot down. Jose Sanchez, Kurt LaPlante, Ralph Harper, and Luis Palacios. In 2006, a POW MIA committee was looking for remains of MIAs and they went to the site. I understand they saw a local farmer there and they asked him if he had seen any bodies, bones or whatever, and he said he did and he had buried them. So they found those remains, and after much DNA testing, they determined that it was those four people that I just mentioned. 2009, they had a ceremony for them in the Arlington National Cemetery in Washington. It was an emotional event, you know, talking to their families and talking about their last days and, and giving them photographs that they'd never seen before, you know. I always think about that this time of year, about uh, LZ Loon and those guys that didn't come back. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for a country to build those memorials for for us, for people that served in the military. Did you ever get your Purple Heart? I said, no, I never got it. I never, you know, thought it was that important. And he said, well, you should, you should get it. And I, I looked into it and you needed two witnesses or whatever. So I started doing some research. In 2013, I received my Purple Heart uh, with the help of Senator Jeff Bingham. And we had a ceremony here at, at Veterans Park here at, in Las Cruces. We had, I think, 130 people there. We had some Marines that came over from El Paso, a captain and a staff sergeant, I think, to present the medal for me. Had a lot of family and friends, uh, people that I've worked with, with the state police, with some of the boards that I belong to here in Doniana County. So there's some kids playing soccer, and they even stopped playing soccer to come over and watch the ceremony with them. Well, you know, I was, uh, I was kind of grateful, you know, that uh, they remembered. On that day, I was grateful that all my friends and family were there. It was a good feeling to be recognized. It was a good feeling. You know, I always remember that day. Yes, I would do it again. I, you know, I wouldn't hesitate to do it again. Uh, I've had, you know, good experiences with you know, in the Marine Corps, along with some bad experiences. When I see the POW MIA flag, it means probably more to me than anybody else because I did, uh, you know, I did have four of my friends that were MIA for so many years. My name is Floyd Stringer. I am here as a Vietnam veteran, was in country in 1969. I'm from Alamogordo, New Mexico. My father was Army, my uncle was involved in combat in Korea, and I had always said that uh, I wanted to be in the Army and came to enlist at the end of February. Wanted to be a pilot, failed the hearing test, but uh, was told that I had a high mechanical aptitude and they said, boy, do we need helicopter mechanics, you're it. And away we went. At landing, we must have been there at two o'clock in the morning when we got in country. And as you file out of the airplane, the first thing that hits you at square between the eyes is the humidity and the heat. I arrived there in January and at night it was 80, 85 degrees and 85% humidity. And the second thing that, that you notice immediately is the odor. The entire country smelled like waste or death or 
rotting vegetation or something. And there was just no, no getting away from that. You did become used to it in a relatively short time. I've never experienced anything like that. Thing where you had to walk down several stairs to get to the ground. And you're starting to hear a little, some booming, sound like thunder in the background. But you turn around and look and there's a big flash accompanied with it. Should I duck? Should I run for cover? Everybody's just standing around with a clipboard. You realize that you have really come to be in the middle of it. And there are no truly safe places for the next however long you're going to be there. I actually became a helicopter instructor for several months before I was sent to Vietnam. Upon my arrival there, where we did 100 hour inspections and repairs on helicopters, but I was on base all day. But from the moment I got there, I began to uh, pester people about becoming a flying crew chief and door gunner. And in about eight weeks, I got that assignment. The duties that changed, I went from preparing aircraft for their daily flights to being a part of those daily flights. Flight days expectancy of a crew chief was about 27 days. And I really didn't find that out until I became a crew chief, but why did we volunteer for those positions? You became adrenaline junkies, if you will, sought the excitement of it. The fear was always there, uh, some days worse than others. Uh, you get out and you go do your job and you ride with your friends and uh, see some of the same faces day in and day out. And I went out and sat down in the crew chief's seat and looked around and there was a bullet hole right here in the wall. And I went, oh my God, what have I done? And thought, oh, I'm not backing out. I'm, not, I'm gonna go do this and make the best of it. And if nothing else, I'll have great stories for my grandkids. We were attached to the 9th Infantry Division. Those guys spent the night in the jungle every night for weeks or months on end. We spent the night in the barracks in a dry bed with a mosquito net, had two hot meals a day, and uh, movies at night occasionally. But our job every day was to get up in the morning, fire up the helicopters, fly out into the jungle, pick these guys up, move them five or 10 kilometers, see if they could get in a fight or get in, in something like that. Then they would call us back and say, okay, nothing here, come get us. And we'd go in and pick them up someplace and move them someplace else and do that until they did get in a fight. And then they would call in assistance Helicopter gunships, which were not slicks. These were the helicopters that had the guns or rockets mounted exterior. And uh, they'd go in and, and kind of back up the grunts and uh, assist them in their fight when they did find it. In retrospect, some people have said how much of a love-hate relationship they had with us. Depended on which direction they were going. You betcha, whether they were being inserted or whether they were being pulled out, you bet. On about April 10th of 1969, uh, I was in my 22nd day as a crew chief, give or take a day, and uh, was flying right door as usual. I preferred to fly the right door since I was left-handed. Our assignment that morning was to go out in the jungle as norm as usual and pick up the 9th Infantry guys and move them out. We have two or three American GIs on board and two VC suspects. The helicopter suddenly stopped. It just, it shook violently as though being hit by a, a huge hammer or something. Just bang, real hard. We had taken one bullet through the main fuel line in our helicopter and cut the fuel to the engine like that. The power quit. You can safely, with a good pilot, Dominic, uh, which I had, a Lieutenant Nimi was his name. The pilot allows the rotor blades to change their angle. You drop faster, but it maintains the rotor speed and at a given point, he jerks that pitch back up and it gives you that cushion of air to land on. We came down in a rubber plantation on a wagon path between the rubber trees and the bamboo. I hate bamboo. Destroyed the helicopter, shoved the skids up inside the body. Everybody else jumped out. I had been doing this for three weeks and didn't have the presence of mind to do that. My M60 barrel it's stuck in the bamboo and I'm bending the gun in the middle. And I looked out and everybody's laying on the ground on their belly looking up at me going, when are you gonna get out of that helicopter? And it finally dawned on me, I jumped out. I was the worst injury on board and I literally took a Band-Aid. My pilot insisted that I go to the medic, we called him Doc Barefoot. 
And he looked at it and gave me a tetanus shot, if I remember correctly. And he said, Stringer, he said, I'm going to put you in for your Purple Heart. And honestly, I can remember it to this day, thinking, you know what, I may be here a whole year and not have another damn thing to show for this. I'm not going to argue about it. And he put me in for my Purple Heart. Someone suggested that I substitute for some guys who hadn't had a day off in a month. I thought about it briefly and said, you bet, let's go do that. On the second or third day as a substitute crew chief, we went over to Ben Trey and have a box of seat rations for lunch. I had finished our lunch and the 9th Infantry Commander called and said, okay, we are in a dry rice paddy, we've established a landing zone, and we have found several uh, booby traps, which today are called IEDs. This set them off so they're no longer a danger to anyone. Uh, they said, okay, come get us, the LZ is secure. We were flying the left wing in a diamond-shaped formation. As you land, the crew chief and gunner's duty on both sides is to stand up, look out at the ground for tree stumps, trip wires, or anything else suspicious. Then you sit down, reach for your microphone button, which is on the tail coming out of your, out of your helmet, and let him know that it's okay to land. You do this when you're four to six feet off the ground. As I sat down and reached for my microphone button, just about the time I got to it, the world changed for me. The ship pitched violently to my left. And everything went into slow motion. You see this belt of ammo go flying by out of your machine gun. The dirt from the explosion is kind of whizzing by. And the helicopter has pitched to the point where it is standing on its nose and everybody's kind of stunned. And my pilot stands up, gets out between the seats and walks out. And I looked up at him and I had looked at my leg and my hand and it was a kind of a bloody mess. And I had never seen anything like that before on anyone, never mind myself. And I looked up at my pilot and I said, Lieutenant, I'm hit and I'm hit bad. And he goes, okay. And that was the last I saw of him. The gunner on the opposite side of the ship he saw my situation, grabbed me by my armpits and dragged me out of the bird, laid me out in the dirt, laid me in his lap, and uh, kind of took care of me and watched over me for a brief period. There was a, uh, a man laying about 20 feet away who was uh, dead, had been badly wounded. And Bart, this door gunner, told me, lighten up, man. He said, take it easy. He said, you're going home and you could be as bad off as him. And I shut up. In that particular explosion and crash, there were 12 wounded and two killed. I was one of the very fortunate ones. I got to keep all my parts. Uh, I lost nothing but a little sanity put me back on a helicopter, which I was really unhappy about, <laughs> and flew me down to Vung Tau to the, uh, to the next hospital where they operated on me. And I woke up about six o'clock the next day talking to my parents on the phone. I went to Camp Zama Army Hospital, Japan, on the second floor, Ward 2A, for eight weeks in skeletal traction. They drilled a hole in my shin, put a pin through the bone, and tied about eight pounds of lead to it, hung it over the end of the bed, and it was to keep that femur straight while it knitted. Put me in a cast from my armpits to the floor, covering one leg, the broken leg, all the way over my foot, and covering the left leg to the knee with a stick between the two for support. And put me back on a 141 at Yokota Air Base and flew me to Travis Air Force Base, California. 22 hours non-stop, scariest flight I've ever had. I have not flown since. Honest to God, I've not been on anything bigger than an elevator in 50 years. <laughs> the next 20 months was time between surgeries. The leg knitted neatly. It took a little bit of time to learn how to walk again after being in traction for two months and plaster for the entire summer for three months. Of all the memories that I retain from the short time that I was in country. You have to remember that I was only in country 90 days. I don't have one that I cherish. It was not that it was all bad times. 
It's just that there were no truly enjoyable times. Folks had to come get me in a station wagon because I didn't bend in the middle. They had to borrow a station wagon to come get me in, load me in the back like a, like a load of lumber back there somewhere. And my friends would come get me that summer when we were in a cast and we'd go to the drive-in. A friend of mine had a car with reclining seats, which in those days was very unusual. And the drive-in was over, we'd go get a hamburger, go get a beer, whatever. And I was sitting in a restaurant on the edge of a booth, one leg stuck straight out in a cast, trying not to slide off in the floor. And some, I'm sorry, some cowboy come by and went, what happened to you, man? And I told him, I said, I asked my Vietnam leftovers. And he goes, welcome home. I will tell you what I've been telling her for 50 years. I'm the luckiest guy you'll ever meet. The reason I went for my own gratification, for my own representation of my country and my way of life, yes, I would have to do it again, you bet. Wouldn't have a choice. I'm Udo Fischer, and I was a pararescue man with the United States Air Force. And in 1970, I had orders to go to Vietnam to the 40th Air Rescue Squadron at Udon for one year tour. And uh, in March 1971, the tour was over, and I could return to my family. I was, uh, at that time, must have been 40s. And so my two comrades with me over there, they were at the same squadron. They were friends from uh, the 1950s Spear Rescue. In fact, I could say when I, after the Korean War, I was over there in the Far East, and once in a while we had to give rescue coverage to American pilots flying American planes for the French in Indochina. It was in 1954, before Dean Van Pew. And uh, they were, C-124s coming in, and I went on the flight line there, they wouldn't let the uh, uh, foreign legionnaires off the aircraft, but they had the clamshells open, I talked to them, and they were ex-German POWs, held by the French, and uh, so they volunteered for the foreign uh, legion, and they were sent in the Dimban Pew. And of course, you know, everybody knows what happened in Dimban Pew. And I thought at that time, boy, I'm glad we're not involved in this stuff. I tried to wipe from my mind the nightmare I had for years bad. I had dreamt about it being over there and have to leave my family behind. That came to my mind. Hey, it was no dream. So I had to overcome that, overcome that quickly, because that would have deeply affected me and my mission. So that's not just me. Everybody had to do the same thing, especially the married men, you know. It was different with them. Younger people maybe, but not these married men had families so home. They were in the same boat like I was. And they all had to adjust themselves. The humidity uh, was miserable, especially during the rainy season. And uh, for us, the relief only came, and there was no air conditioning where we lived, you know. You had to go to NCO, NCO Club, maybe they had some air conditioning, but still was not sufficient. And so uh, when you were orbiting up there, on your orbit, you had all the ramps open, everything, so you get cool air. That's the only time you could cool off when you fly up there, high up in altitude, you know. Our mission was humanitarian, and I say our, because it was not just para rescue, was the whole air crew involved. The pilots, co-pilots, flight engineers, sometimes even a combat photographer on it. But there always were two pair of rescue men on each uh, helicopter we had at Udo. But our mission was humanitarian. And each mission you go in combat uh, areas, you have to uh, assume that you might get shot down, like we did. We lost some chops. Back then in 70, 71, there was no night vision goggles like they have now. So you couldn't go on a night mission. If there was somebody down and had to be rescued, you had to wait till daylight. And of course, they know the position where they want and hope that the enemy didn't get to them first. The problem was 
to identify, make sure the person on the radio down there when you get back in at, by daylight was not the enemy forcing the individual to call him in so they can shoot down the helicopter. Very often they waited to the last moment, didn't shoot at the Sandys, which were the A1E uh, Sky Raiders, which escorted us, the fighter bomber aircraft. And they usually sanitized the area around us, you know, to uh, when there was a pickup, to have any enemies keep their head down, you know. So when they got in there, and if the person was injured, that meant they had to hover. Hoist went down, a pair of rescue men went down on the hoist. And, uh, pick up the injured. Sometimes if they're badly injured, the other PJ had to leave the minigun on the back end, the number three position, go down the hoist to assist them in the litter, get them in the litter and get the patients up there. In the meantime, the chopper had to keep his position. Now, so much credit really goes to the pilot. The efficiency, I mean, plus being an enemy and being shot at sometimes, see? The same thing as the flight engineer. He stood in the open door, handle it. So he was exposed. So everybody was really exposed during these moments. And sometimes it could take up 15 minutes, you know, for that, to make a pickup. But uh, overall, basically, no, we just were there for saving life in the 18th engine. That basically was our mission. The only involvement I had with the Zante raid was flying aboard one of two Jolly Green helicopters between a, a PDJ, this plane, the Jaws, and the Fisher's Mouse, they used to call it, that's equal with Hanoi, where the raiders had gone. Well, we didn't know what was going on. Everything was quiet. We didn't know what the mission was all about, but we took off. And uh, as we start orbiting up there, the pilot finally broke the ice and just within our communication, nothing going went to the outside. He briefed us that there was a Sante mission rate in progress and we were there to orbit. If any of the radars went down, we were to go after them and pick them up. So we heard over in Intercom now what's going on at the raid. Sam's going off left and right, all over the place. Oh shit, now you gotta go in. <laughs> But that's going on and on, and finally then, uh, near the end there, then we heard the choppers. They had the code side. We didn't know what that meant. Nobody had any idea what all the code side meant. They talk about packages and stuff like that. And they start counting, oh, we got 36 packages, and you know what's going on. Well, we didn't know what's going on, so I counted them. Well, they must have had over 100 uh, prisoners, you know? So, and at that time, a weasel, what they call a weasel, that uh, jet had uh, been uh, been hit by shrapnel from the uh, from the uh, Sam exploded close by, and he was pretty close to where we were orbiting, and they bailed out both guys. You know, when we were there, you know, let them pick him, uh, us pick him up. No, they told us you stay orbiting. Your mission is the radar. The first choppers, which we didn't know, didn't have anybody on there, didn't have to pick up a special for They had room. So they made the pickup of these two, two uh, bears on pipe and uh, what the heck is going on? They got all these prisoners and we orbit and they let them pick it up. Something didn't uh, add up. Well, they all landed and then came at uh, you know. Then we could go back. It was seven o'clock in the morning when we landed. So the first one was the ground maintenance group. I said, well, how many did we get? He said, none. Well, come on, I heard it all. Well, what we found out was the code was for the special forces teams. They were out there, had been dispatched to sanitize the area and uh, secure the area. And they had all been picked up again. And there were no losses, including all these missiles, uh, SAMs going on. And there were no mid-air collision because all the helicopters, the fixed wing or the, the uh, Sandy, they had no lights. The, the mission was brilliantly conducted in a way, but, but there was no proof. Now the day after the raid, I designed the patch, the Zante radar patch, and it's still officially approved. And there's a picture in there in my, in my book there. But uh, it's approved and used by the raiders, the special forces, 
and also the uh, pararescue and air rescue crews in general, not just pararescue. But the amazing thing was there were no losses on that mission. That was mind-boggling. You don't count down, at least not when you want to keep your mind off it. You have to keep your mind off it because it, it's a nightmare otherwise. If you have a family you love, you don't want to, like in my case, I had a wife and six kids. Hey, you know, that is a nightmare if you let it happen. Of course, the GIs, everybody was talking about it and pretty upset. What the heck are you blaming the GIs for? We've been sent over there to go after the politicians who are doing all that. That was our general consensus, you know. But it was, it was revolting to see what happened. And you saw that was actually treason, what we thought, when you have a war going on to attack the military, you know, like that. And say, you know, give them all kinds of bad names and stuff like that. And it's, you know, that, that really hits hard. We are there because we are assigned to defend the country. We, we gave an oath to do everything. So you're over there under your oath and do the best you can. Whatever war zone you get uh, sent into, if you agree with it or not, you still got to do your best. If I had to, if I was ordered to, if I was in a position, like I said, it was my job. I would have no choice, I had to go. It was not voluntary. So, especially when you got a family, you have to be ordered that you go and do the best you can. My number was way too high. I would have never been drafted, never. But it's our duty as young men to protect this country and I took that into consideration. I was 20 years old at that time, so I went on February the 24th, 1971. During my basic, there was nine of us that signed up to go to airborne school. Halfway through AIT, we all decided we didn't want to go. When we graduated from AIT, the company that I was in, they got sent to Germany, and us nine stayed in Fort Ord, and our orders were delayed. And then they, they called me and they said, you have, you have your orders, you're going to Vietnam. Okay. When we got to Vietnam, or when I got to Vietnam, it was hot. It looked like a, I mean, like a heater. Humid. Humid. And they took us to um, the mess hall. And then, uh, and then in the distance, we could hear boom, boom. And I look out toward the sea, and there's the, the Navy ship. I said, wow, this is real now, <laughs> this is real. My first stop was in Cameron Bay. And, and as a matter of fact, they me from, from Cameron Bay, I went into the jungle in, in Da Nang. That was my first one. I had my, my rucksacks and all that, everything was brand spanking new, I mean clean, boots were shining and all that, you know. The sergeant, he was uh, from the Philippines, and he saw me and said, you're gonna be my new pig man. I said, oh boy, I know what the pig man was. I didn't. I found out very quick, like the next day, and they gave me the machine, and so I was a big man. And my first mission was seven days or ten days, something like that, and during that time, I was wet the whole time. Soaking wet, it was miserable. And the other, the guys there, the, the old guys there, they wouldn't tell you how to do things. You had to learn on your own, OJ team, and you learn very, very quick. The M60, the modified 30 out 6, and um, it weighs, I think it's 21 pounds, and for every 100 rounds, it was 8 pounds. And I remember when I carried it, I used to carry about 800 rounds, plus a teaser belt. A teaser belt anywhere from 80 to 100 rounds. We were always ready. And I liked the machine gun, I did. But when the, when the job became important for, for appointment, I said, I'll take that, because it was, it, it was lighter, it was lighter. And I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the machine gun, but I really enjoyed being point man. I really did. I carried the machine gun for about, for about six weeks. The platoon sergeant asked us, uh, he said, I need an appointment. And uh, I volunteered right away. And he came up to me and he asked me, he says, why do you want to be point man? 
And without hesitation, I said, because I trust myself more than anybody else. And there was a first response that came to my mind, and he just looked at me and he said, the job is yours. It's just like any job. You know, you, you, some people are reporters, some people are whatever. It's just part of your job, and you, you learn to accept it. And out there, you, 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 you have to do it. People are depending on you, and you're depending on other people also, so it, it's, a, it's a good job. It's a good job if you take pride in it because the guys look up to you or you look up to the guys and watch each other. Appointment is the first one to walk in the jungle. That time we had machetes. If you know what a machete is, a machete. Well, we used to keep it very sharp. Our captain or the LT would tell us what direction to go. So the guy in the front of the appointment used to hack away at the, at the jungle with the weight of minute vines and all that and elephant grass and whatever there was and just to make a little pathway so that you could go. There was a lot of times there was trails and the trails, that was a no-no because you could never tell if there were going to be booby traps. So it was best to make your own trail. I mean, usually we had to go maybe in a click, a couple of clicks a day. We used to carry all our food on our back for three day supplies, water, a sleeping bag. If you want to call it a sleeping bag, most of us just carried a, a poncho plus your ammunition. So it got to be pretty heavy. And then going up and down the jungle, oh yeah, slipping and sliding. It's like being in a, in a great big water slide. They used to send us out and, on patrols in different parts of, of the jungle. And usually it was um, a company. And then sometimes it was just a couple of squads. Sometimes it was just a platoon. So it just depended on what they were looking for or what they, what, what they sent us out there for. Most of the time, it was um, four platoons. There was five of us that were always ahead of the, of the rest of the, of, the, of the company. They asked us to volunteer, and we did. And it was myself and Rubolino, Thompson, and David Perry, which was from Albuquerque. He was, uh, he was a black guy, he was my, he was my sergeant, and, and the lieutenant. A lot of times we were away from, from the rest of the guys and we were, I guess, we were reconnaissance to check out the area and all that. And we found, we found some ugly stuff. Us five guys, we had a very strong bond, a very strong bond. And we, we could anticipate, we knew what to expect from the other guy. Now the other guys in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in the company or platoon, yeah. Yeah, you learn how to respect them, but you always, you always bond with somebody. And us five, we, we were very, very, very tight, very tight, very tight. And we watched, we, we watched out for each other. And it, and it was, it was well worth it. It was well worth it. The five of us were a long ways from the company, and the LT had asked, had asked us to go out there quite a ways from everybody else, and we, we said yes, so we did. We ran into five of them, and I remember the LT, we were side by side, and he went like this. And we knew what it meant. He just learned. He counted to one, two, three, and we threw grenades and for the, for the weapons. And it was over within 30 seconds, I guess. And we went there and there was blood on the leaves and bodies and it was a mess. And we were, we were kind of, well, we were kind of elated, I guess. So we get back and we call, or the LT called, and we go back to the company. So I guess higher, higher ups want us to go back out there at night time. So the LT asked us if we were going to go back with him. And we said yes, we will. We will. So we set up a code for the radio and we went back out there. We get out there at night time and we set up a perimeter and all of us are real close together. That night, and I said this very, very few times in my lifetime, that night was the longest night of my life. They were all around us. We could hear them talking, we could hear them stepping, walking. We could, we could smell the cigarettes. How many, I don't know, but there was a bunch of them. There was a bunch of them, and we, we did not 
I mean, we could hear ourselves breathing. We just, how they didn't find us? Because only, only God knows. And we didn't do nothing. We just stayed there, not even the radio, nothing, nothing. And they were ha ha ha, and you could hear the laughter and the sh shattering and all that. And when daybreak came, we ran. We ran. And that was the longest night of my life. And I was due for leave, you know, personal leave. And uh, a lot of guys were going to Australia, you know, Bangkok. And I said, I had, I had 10 days. And I said, hey, I'll, I'll go back home. I get off the airport in El Paso. And I hitch a ride from El Paso to Las Cruces. Okay, I get to Las Cruces on Main Street, and I'm walking, and a car pulls up beside me, and he asked me, he says, where are you coming from? And I told him I come from Vietnam. He said, come on, come on. So we stopped in Baird, and at, at the Triangle Bar, and he bought me a beer. Anyway, we get to the house, and my mom and dad are driving up, and Willie and I are driving up. And I get down, and my dad looks at me, and <laughs> he looked me. He recognizes me from when we started hugging and all that. <clears throat> so he tells Willie, thank you. And then my dad says, how did you get here? I said, I was walking there in cruises. And he told my mom, we saw him walking, remember? About a week later, I get a, I get a, a phone call. And my mom told me, it's, it's for you. And I said, okay, so I answered the phone and there's this E4 Jose Ray, and I said, this is this. And, I said, and they said, well, your orders have been changed. You're supposed to report to the Republic of Vietnam immediately. And I said, okay, I knew what was happening. So by the time I left Silver, went back to Nome, came back to Silver, it was 12 days. And they, they let me out. And I had to sign waivers. I didn't care what I signed. I just wanted to go home, and I did. And for lack of a better word, when I signed my papers, I put down I-D-G-A-F. And I'll let you, I'll let you figure it out. It was a cultural shock to me because of the things that were happening throughout the world, throughout the, the U.S., throughout the world, you know, how they hated, how they hated the soldiers, especially those that came from Nam. So I was very reserved about saying where I, where, where I was at. Very reserved. As a matter of fact, I was kind of embarrassed about it. I was kind of embarrassed to, to say that I was from Vietnam because at that time, people just didn't. People had no respect for it. They don't. They, they, they didn't. So, just one thing for you, you, you get over it. You get over it and try to make the best that you can. And I did, I did. It's like a videotape. Rewind, forward, rewind, forward. It never goes away. Just thank, thank God that nothing happened. And there was a lot of us did a lot of praying. A lot of praying. I've talked to the psychiatrist because I, I did go to a PTSD program in Tucson. It's a hard program, but you find peace and you learn how to cope with it. You cope the best way you can. Sometimes by talking, sometimes by praying, sometimes by not just not saying anything. I'm gonna speak for myself because I, I can't speak for the other veterans, but I'm I'm very proud to have been a part of this interview because I won't be here much longer. Right? That's the reality of life. And I would like to have something like that too for her or her, our grandkids or even even our child can say, hey, I remember that SOB, you know, and, 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 and looking at all that and, and saying that we are human. Even though we're, we're got attitudes, you know, we're impatient, we're outspoken, sometimes we're disrespectful, but deep down inside, we know what we are. And, we, and, 
I said, because we have too much pride? I don't know. But we have a lot of feelings and a lot of us are too macho and don't want to say anything about it. It's time to say something because we need to let the other people know how, how we are, what we went through, how people see us now. Even if, they, even if we're just to stay here in the United States, but to, to show something that there is responsibility that one has to take, especially in today's society. It's not always what's for me, it's what for everybody. Thank you. I appreciate it. To me, I'm proud. I'm proud to be going to service because we all have a choice of going. And a lot of us don't want to go. For whatever reason, only they know. I went and I'm glad I went. And I saw what, what, could, what could be done if people don't stand up for you, for your right. I wish that there was no wars. It's just part of life, it's just part of the life cycle. But I, w I would go back. <laughs>